Hey, Nerdpreneurs, Chris coming at you. In today's Talking Nerdy, Frank and I are going to share some reflections from one of our earlier interviews with Monkey DM. It is hands down one of our best interviews where we discover how he built a Dungeons & Dragons content business from nothing to over $10,000 a month. Now, there's a ton of other great nuggets of gold throughout that episode, and if you haven't listened to that episode, or maybe it was just a long time ago, you might want to go back to interview number 10 with Monkey DM and give it a listen before you listen to today's Reflections episode. I'll link it in the show notes for you. He really is the archetype for what a nerdpreneur is in our minds when we created the show. If you don't care about listening to the old interview, there's still lots of gold in this conversation between Frank and I, so without further ado... Here's today's Talking Nerdy. Talking Nerdy. We're just Talking Nerdy. With all this Talking Nerdy. Oh, come on, you wanna talk nerdy? This is episode 10, yeah. Yeah, episode 10 with Monkey DM, who I even acknowledged this at the beginning of the episode, was almost the archetype for what I defined as a nerdpreneur, mainly because he really is like thriving at a high level in his niche. And it is very much a unique and cool niche called Dungeons and Dragons content. And uh, he's found a way to be very, very, very successful um, at a high level. Yeah, and for listeners, you know, if if you did listen to this episode, fantastic. You probably know what we're going to talk about. But if you didn't and you're just tuning into this, then we're going to talk a more we're going to talk about a lot more than just Dungeons and Dragons. There's a lot of business stuff in here that Evan shared, and I'm really excited for us to just dive into it, as well as just kind of general life values that he emulates so well. Mhm. Mm well, yeah, he was just a really great guy. And what I'm curious about is, uh, well, I mean, I don't know, a guy who becomes a doctor or wants to become a doctor, like that's what the beginning of this story is, which is kind of funny, is, you know, right. he's, it's rare that somebody is like, I'm going to become a doctor and actually really wants to be a doctor and then goes through all the schooling and then like gets to the point of being almost a doctor and then goes in to make Dungeons and Dragons content instead. You know, yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of reason why that was the case. His story is great. Go listen to the episode if you haven't, because his story about how that transition out of necessity happened. But the fact that he he just seems like a really good dude who wants to help people. But then on top of that, now is kind of was forced out of the ability to do that as a doctor in many ways because of pandemic issues and et cetera, et cetera, that you can listen to the episode about. But the fact that it kind of works out and he goes into this place of being like, I am now a Dungeons and Dragons creator. And actually, in many ways, makes more impact and more money than he did. Uh, would have. Than he would have as a uh, Romanian doctor. Yeah, he switched the MD into a DM. Uh -huh. I love that. I love yeah. that he, he talks about the story of how his uh, monkey DM name came to be. And and I just loved that little tidbit. Just gave his name such meaning. Yeah. So we, we slid that in at the end of the episode. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that that I believe we both want to talk about that was such an important and kind of something that we don't hear enough about on our interviews was the idea of generosity and how that can take shape in our nerdpreneur businesses. Um, we we often talk about the mindset of it, but actual tactics and strategies to do that and he talked about putting it in his patreon and as he has made more and more content he started to make his con like the individual packets and like the one shots he made them free but then he started to put them into these compendiums which were where people really showed up for yeah well i mean it's uh so just to be clear, I mean, I think you're not talking about, say, like charity specifically or giving uh, a percentage of your of your profits, because I, I wasn't sure. That's I right. Know, yeah, because we're actually talking about intentional uh, sales uh, and Im impactful t tactics that can lead people into a place called reciprocation. And that can be very, very useful as a as a tactic to generate more sales or a strategy to generate sales. And I think he fell into that. Uh, and a lot of entrepreneurs sort of do if they feel a little bad about charging for their work. I don't know. Do it's, you, it, it is a theme, you know? 
do you think he felt bad about charging for his work and that's why he started giving away stuff for free? I think that, uh, I okay, I don't know if he felt bad or good about it, but I think a lot of entrepreneurs feel awkward charging for their first pieces of work. They sure. often feel a need to get validated by their industry or get validation from outside in their first attempt at uh, doing something. So, and, and, and I'm saying this from our own experience, right? Like we've mm -hmm. definitely done that. We give out, like all of our first episodes were like, we didn't charge for anything. Like we created probably 30 podcasts without asking for money <laughs> at all. And right. uh, and realizing like down the road, it's like, okay, well maybe we should start asking for money at some point. Like maybe we should start getting some patrons you know, just so that we we stop losing money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like like moving that direction, and it's great because it does start to, to start to build when you make that transition. But I think the goodwill you you build up by providing free content, and the other thing too is it's probably not that great at first, and then you figure out what it is, and then it gets better, and then it gets to the point of being able to be charged uh, for it. Uh, and, and then, you know, but but there's a there's a milestone for people who are entrepreneurs or nerdpreneurs where they have to go from that place of, you know, like my stuff, like my stuff, like my stuff to buy my stuff. Mm -hmm. I think there's a really nice way that he summed up his beginning uh, with he actually didn't. I don't think he said this directly, but what he was saying, at least that I heard, was about how he was posting his free content on Reddit a platform that he frequented and that he started frequenting and noticing the other people that are doing it and seeing how it's done and what's accepted on Reddit, the, the uh, proper etiquette. And then that really worked for him. And I think finding that place where people are talking in your niche, you, where your audience and your customers are talking, potential customers, being a part of that is really important. And I think that's one of the reasons you and I, you know, talk, bringing Nerdpreneur as an example into this. I think it's one of the reasons you and I are uh, hesitant to get into Reddit is just because we don't have that much experience with it. And neither of us really have the time to dedicate to it at this moment. And yeah. it would be a great place for us if we started posting our free episodes there like he did with his free content. It might be. I, I just don't even know where would we do that. Like, it makes sense because Unearthed Arcana, which is the subreddit that he frequented, is dedicated and has, I think it's hundreds of thousands of people on yeah. it, right, that are interested in homebrew content. So essentially, Reddit has found your niche and completely isolated them into this, like, nice convenient place that you as anyone can go and post as long as you follow the rules and if your content is good it can actually thrive and and move up so that's really cool but i i don't know what podcasts are using reddit to move the needle and i also don't know what moves the needle on reddit other than free you know like the one thing i do know is that and this comes from Mankey dm and also from other people but it's just Reddit wants free stuff. You know, you're not going on there to tell people to buy my stuff. It's about here's what I do for free. Here's some free stuff. If you like it, cool. And you can get some level of notoriety from that. And you can move the needle on getting attention. I think that's what Reddit's really good for is potentially getting attention. Um, you know, there is lots of examples of things going viral through Reddit. Uh, and making a real impact in the world, like GameStop was all a Reddit, right? Like it was from that. You know what I'm talking about when I say GameStop? You look. At you mean the stock? Yeah, the stock thing, right? Mm -hmm. That happened a while ago. People forget, I guess, but it was all based in a Reddit thread where people were like, "We don't want GameStop to, you know, be bought out or close or something like that," and so everyone started <laughs> inflating the price of the stock. Um, artificially, and it messed with all of the uh, all of the people. And you know, that's like what what really goes viral on on Reddit. I don't know. Like it it sort of drops like bird shit. You don't really know exactly what's going to happen. But what is nice, I guess, in the Dungeon and Dragons market, they had this nice little isolated thing. I don't know if it works for. I don't know if how it would work for for podcasts because it's an audio medium too, right? Like, and this is just another example or another point to the fact that it's not something Reddit isn't a place that you and I frequent. And I mean, we've heard from JJ art creation. She frequented Reddit and that's where she started to get a lot of good feedback on her work as well as Facebook. And then monkey DM talked about Reddit. We've heard other people talk about Reddit. Uh, 
I think Vic, uh, Suity Fiddle, she did. Um, and then I believe somebody else, a couple of, we've heard it before. Yeah. And, and it's just one of those things that we know. Now, that does tie into something else that he talked about, which is, um, so that point being places that you frequent where there's a discussion already happening and people, that audience is already curated and in a space together is great. Now, on the other side of the coin, going to a place that is quote unquote popular, and he gave TikTok as the example, can be a great place for awareness and everything. But if it's not something that you really like and it's a platform you really want to be on, then it's going to feel like it's sucking your soul and it's going to turn this exciting thing that we've turned into a business uh, less exciting and less fun. Hence why he stopped using TikTok. Yeah, well, I mean, that's not there, the reason. But there, there's a number of reasons why uh, people should stop using TikTok. But uh, I, I will just say a couple, couple things on this. I think what you're talking about is appropriate usage for the platform you know mm -hmm. like reddit reddit demands a certain type of thing like he mentions reddit ads don't do them nobody wants to pay for anything on reddit they want free stuff on reddit so you got to create good free content to build up your reputation and then move people over cool well it's not that different on other places like for example like youtube you know you what youtube likes is regular posting right it also enjoys that you have sort of semi long form content like they they have really shorts they have shorts right which have to be what a minute or something and, it, and it's mm -hmm. been pushing those that does help with your engagement but the idea is that those shorts lead people to your channel where they get to digest 10 to 20 minute ideally uh sized episodes of something right so they find i think that it tends to push out content in that level of of engagement for people so that you can be able to keep people but then when you look at so so what it what it looks for is like people who are looking to learn or looking to grow or looking to expand their knowledge on certain things and it'll suggest all these other things that will expand your knowledge to give you a different perspective on that thing which is why you can go down a youtube rabbit hole and wind up being a conspiracy theorist because there's <laughs> things like that that happen right um and then if you really want to know someone Go look at their YouTube feed, right? Like that's really what they're what they're about. What and pops up on their homepage? <laughs> exactly, right. So I think that that's a really interesting. Thing. But then we're talking. Okay, let's talk about Instagram for a second. What kind of content uh, it works there? Well, right now they're pushing Reels, right? It's Reels, 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 Reels. It started as a video platform, but Instagram kind of has this weird amalgamation of all the platforms together. I think you mean it started as a photo platform, and now yeah. it's videos. Yeah, sorry. It started as a uh, as a as a photo platform, and now it's reels. But it's also it kind of it also does that Snapchat thing with like stories, and then mm -hmm. it also has a messaging service, and it also has the ability to comment. And so, Instagram is like the biggest social media platform, by the way, in the world. And I think it's because it incorporates a lot of these various things that people enjoy into one convenient platform. So you can kind of go there and do what you like. But the Instagram algorithm. It's fickle and it changes based on what Instagram thinks is important at the time. And then you go to TikTok and TikTok is really just about addicts. Like it's really about <laughs> like that's the kind of content. And it's it wants. consistent. It, like you mentioned the algorithm on Instagram being fickle. TikTok's algorithm seems to be consistent. Yeah, if you post every day or multiple times a day, which is what it wants you to do, is like you post morning, night, and you know you also create new content constantly. It protects you if your content sucks, but if your content is consistent and eventually gets good, something will hit and all of a sudden you'll get like a massive upswing. And the problem with TikTok is like, what's the back end of that? Like often you can't collect anything off of TikTok, uh, especially if you're not in America, like there's not really a good profit sharing model there for it. And then on top on top of that, the the TikTok ability to call to action, which is to move people f to a website or to um, opt in for an email or to buy your product or to do like it's actually really hard. Like the things that tend to work or seem to work are if you know you can go viral for a specific type of product and then have like an amazon affiliate link for that product somewhere there that's the mythos that oh you can sell this this crazy TikTok product right or people were buying like TikTok leggings this is a great example of that right like oh man look at these TikTok leggings. they're going viral so everybody's gonna buy them and then whoever <laughs> owns that or has that as a reseller can make some money on it right so 
it, it's kind of about bringing eyes to weird things. But most of the content on TikTok is not trying to sell anything. It's just like, give me attention, give me attention, give me attention. It's about going viral. And I don't know always how to monetize that. From what I understand, like in, in many ways, like you can do it for the attention and many people do it just for the attention. But are they monetizing that? I don't know. I'm not sure that every single one of those people is able to move those people over to something. So I've been this reviewing this episode's actually this interview's actually been really interesting because for my day job and my own interest, I've been educating myself on YouTube shorts a lot more. And in general, short form content, short form video content, because I've I have a lot of experience with longer form, the short form stuff is not really the call to actions in them almost aren't existent. The call the best way to do a call to action in a YouTube short, for example, is to pin a comment in the comment section. Don't even bother with the description. If you put stuff in the description, great. But the point or the best way to put like a link is like if you say in the short reel you say hey you know look in the comment section to find our email list uh, to sign up you know you put that in the comments and you pin it because apparently people scroll through comments a lot i don't i am one of those people that is like i watch the video i give it a like and i move on i don't look at the comments but apparently a lot of people do so in general, what I'm saying is that short form videos tend to be, like you said, great for attention and awareness. And maybe they'll help someone's awareness go really viral if a short is really good. And I think that's a, a common thread for TikTok and Instagram Reels and YouTube Shorts, that if you want to get attention, shorts are fantastic. Because by design, they're, these short videos, it... It doesn't matter if your video is short or long, you know, long being full 60 seconds, because they're all short videos. And as people scroll through them, the views rack up that much faster. It's a hockey stick curve on a graph. It is just so much quicker to get views on short content that it's so easy to get attention on your brand and your content. So it's just designed by nature to be that way. People aren't going to stop and click on something if they are scrolling. If they're on the scroll, on the roll, like, I, I don't know if that's a thing. I sound totally like a boomer when I say that, but like, it is It is definitely you're on the, the roll. way to do it. <laughs> yeah, if you're on the scroll, <laughs> the roll kids get it. <laughs> Uh, that's funny. It's like on the scroll, put that on a t-shirt. Um, I, I, I mean, cause I, I like that. Okay. Double entendre, right? D and D shirt on the scroll. I'm a wizard. Mm -hmm. And also I'm on the scroll with the TikTok and the reels and stuff. Anyway, <laughs> we'll see. Maybe there's an idea there. Uh, what, what, I, well, YouTube shorts doesn't pay for monetization either, right? No, it does. If you are monetized, if your channels monetize. Your channel needs to be able to be, I meaning needs to be eligible for money. So YouTube Shorts, I also, you can get money from YouTube Shorts? I am 80% sure YouTube Shorts gives you money. Okay. Well, we should look into that and verify. Uh, I fact check that. <laughs> that doesn't sound right to me, but maybe it is. I don't know. Um, my, my mind moves towards, okay, when you're doing short form when you're doing short form content, a lot of times people, yeah, it's like, you know, what can your calls to action even be? I, I actually think the main thing is drawing attention to your channel or to your profile. So for example, with reels on Instagram, it's like, follow me, right? Like that's the main call to action, right? Follow me for more or comment in the DMs or, you know, something like that is a call to action for a short. In YouTube, you don't have messaging. So you only have comments. It's like, leave a comment on this that's what they want you to do because that can be the call to action or subscribe to my channel you know like this video subscribe like those are the main calls to action for any type of content at least on youtube uh, when it comes to to those kind of things because you have no ability to message now how can you turn people from that into real clients and that's where i, I we've talked about this with arcane anthems and there are things that draw attention to you and then there are things that actually make you money and you have to have a little bit of both in the internet universe. You have mm -hmm. to do things that are creating attention. And then you also have to have like sort of a funnel that brings people along to where they actually pay you for something. And so knowing where that funnel is going is really important. And that's where, you know, for, for a YouTube short, for example, you could have them call to action or like encourage them to 
you know, comment or uh, subscribe. And then your next videos that they digest, your longer form videos, they can have deeper calls to action in them around say like, hey, if you wanna learn more about this specific thing, go to our website and download this free thing and get opt in for our our list, right? And the reason I keep talking about this because this came up during a Monkey DMs episode is that if you're not building an email list, you're you're really missing out on the whole point of being in the online space. And I know this might be a controversial idea for some of you that are out there who are social media users and think email is dead and, and doesn't make sense. But I'll tell you one thing. Um, anybody who has a very large email list, uh, they're the ones who love the fact they have an email list. The only people who say you don't need an email list are the people who don't have one and they don't realize the real impact of it. And, right. I, and, and I've told people this before that if you're building your business on social media platforms, you're building your business on rented ground. OK, so the algorithms can change. You know, what if this. What if Apple releases this new thing that, that you wear around and that completely revolutionizes, I don't think it will, but let's just say a year from now, we're all wearing these Apple devices that are $3,500 on, our, the on goggles. our faces, the goggles, the Apple goggles. I think it's not going to work, but I'm just saying, yeah. what if something like that comes along and now every social media platform is completely having to shift what they do and how they do it in order for it to stay relevant and everything that you've created and everything you've done is no longer uh, going to have any of the impact that it once has. So now you're on rented ground. The thing I do know is people are still going to need their emails. They still use them to opt in. It's the place to secure everything. People are at least going in there to check their passwords and to confirm their emails for everything. Like it's this weird weird bastion of security online that people still use. And we actually, if you own someone's email address, it's a very personal thing. Like you can get into their life and be able to move the needle. When we work in email marketing, if you send an email offering something, you start to get sales right away. You create impact. If you send a video or a podcast out, you start to get views and listens right away. It gives you a semblance of control over what you're doing. And it's really the only online asset that you have. One uh, story quickly from back when I used to manage a business's marketing team, we had several channels. We had the email marketing, where we had about 14,000 email addresses. And then we also had smaller but substantial Facebook presence, Instagram presence, uh, a growing, pretty good growing YouTube presence, and Pinterest. And the most, our, most of our money came from our emails. You know, Pinterest was a big ad and YouTube was a big ad to that contribution. But emails on the whole were huge. And it's not because we were getting 14,000 clicks. We in fact got a pretty humble percentage of opens. It was a uh, around, if we were lucky, we'd get around a 13% open rate, which is not bad in the email marketing world. It's pretty normal to have around a 10%. Um, but the real magic is when that click through happens on the email and people go to where you tell them in the email. Because if if you're not from if folks aren't familiar with how email marketing works, it's very similar to social media. It's just that you need to put something personal crafted into the email or maybe just a newsletter. And you need to have a focused point of, you know, uh, click. Well, my God, CTA call to action. You need to have a, a very concise place where you want people to go in that email so that you can turn it into dollars or whatever you're trying to draw attention to. It's, it's yeah. huge. It's huge. And, and if, if people don't believe it. Yeah. And, and, it. I, and, and, and I'll just say this too, because I, I don't think we really talked about when well, we talked a lot of, uh, okay. In this episode with monkey DM, we talked about a lot of things to do with tactical things to draw clients to you through Reddit, through content, through collecting emails, through bringing them onto Patreon. We talked a lot about, you know, building out your funnel and how to create that, right? And so one of the ways he did that was by giving out free content. Uh, the thank you economy, I think is what he referred to it from Gary Vaynerchuk, which you can actually read about, I believe in the book, Crush It, which uh, is one of his earlier books or the next mm. one, which is Jab, Jab, Right Hook. Uh, and so it's really about giving, say, free content uh, or some really important areas of, of 
transformation for people for free. And then at the end of it, asking. So it's like jab, 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 which is free. Here's like your three awesome pieces of content. And then you ask for the order. So there's a few reasons why this works. One is there are multiple sales triggers you can hit when you give people free stuff. So one is reciprocation. When I give you the, uh, the, a bunch of, uh, if I give you a bunch of information that you are looking for for free and those bits of information actually give you a transformation in your life, whether that be helping you with your Dungeons and Dragons game that week or whether it be, uh, you know, teaching you how to play a guitar, you know, like it could be any number of things that you're teaching, but giving away something free creates reciprocation. And also by teaching you it, you also trigger another one called authority, which is another important uh, sales trigger where you become an authority on the specific area that I'm teaching, right? And then along with that, um, you also create usually some level of community uh, by posting it publicly because the community comes in and says, wow, this is so good. This is really awesome. I tried this and it works. And then you get testimonials and people who are saying you're an authority. And then you get this community buy-in from people around you too. So like, and this and like 16 other sales triggers actually uh, go through, you can, you can create in this kind of long form or free form content before you ever ask people to actually buy. There's a process that you go through, which is like one, two, three, or a couple of pieces that then you after that are able to um, ask people to spend money and purchase which is what he did with his compendium he created a bunch of like here's a bunch of free stuff week after week after week here's free stuff i created for you building up that goodwill that reciprocation that authority and then afterwards asking well now that you got that let me conveniently place this all in one compendium which is a great place for you to go to find all your solutions for any of your you know, magic or monsters or anything you're doing in your game and buy it for this decent and really acceptable price. Yeah, there's two things I want to say. First one is visually, I like to um, uh, in, remember there's kind of like when you, so, okay, slight tangent, fun little story. One of my friends growing up, his dad was uh, from like the heart of Italy or sorry, his his dad's grandma was from the heart of Italy and taught his dad about how to cook. And some of the best ways to do it is uh, one of the best dishes was with quail. And so the way to trick wild quail into being in a space that you could eventually go and get them is you start feeding them regularly in a location. So you would put rice out uh, in various places for the quail to be drawn in towards this regular spot. And about every day you put that rice out or every other day you put that rice out as kind of like, okay, here, like the quail learn, the quail learn. And eventually... <laughs> It's going to get a little morbid for some folks, but eventually the rice that you put out there is soaked in wine hmm. and it's soaked in wine so that the quail get drunk. And then you come out there and you just collect the drunk quail hmm. and then you've got quail to cook with. So the point, though, is that as you create these different funnels, like you're saying, and you find ways for people to get attracted to a same place. And you, once they're there and they're regular followers, then you have that eventual, eventually you soak it with some wine. And in this analogy, what I'm saying is you provide that call to action, like you're saying. So there, that's one thing. And then the second thing is you're talking about like educational content, informative content that also shows the creator to be a source of authority. And that's one of the reasons I love YouTube is because YouTube gives you that platform to actually provide long form content like us, like what we do and what we put on YouTube. It's very informative and educational. And ideally, people will see the value over time and say, hey, like, this is good stuff. And just like Monkey DM was saying, you know, people eventually that thank you and what you were just saying about the thank you uh, principle and how over time people will say, OK, you know, thanks so much. And eventually you say, you know, all this free stuff, if you wanted to hit me back, Here's an opportunity to uh, uh, return the favor. Yeah. I do like that he also mentions in context that, yes, give free stuff, but also know your worth and charge mm -hmm. for things that are like eventually you have to get to the point of being like, well, you're doing this well. Let's make some money off of it. And, you know, having, for example, a 
a one dollar tier on Patreon was something is like, ah, don't do that because your work is worth more than a dollar, right? That was such and a good lesson next... from I remember from back when we interviewed him. I love that point. Yeah, yeah. Cause I know we've literally been talking about that on about our Patreon at that time. And I think you were like, yeah. we can have a one dollar. I'm like, I didn't like the idea of a one dollar tier either. I think I think <laughs> we were we were going back and forth on this a little bit. And uh, you know, just because even yeah, it doesn't matter to me that it's affordable. I, I everyone can afford a dollar. I just don't think it it shows any indication of the value that we're creating in the market. And, you know, the the fact is that if you have a lot of people who are like at that low of a tier, you're cannibalizing people who could potentially spend five or 10 or, or 25, you know, like if you just give people fewer options, um, you know, the, the people you'll wind up getting better quality clients and overall a uh, better engagement, which is, I think what we found as well. Um, the and on that note, when you start to have enough backlog of content, then you can, I think, raise the price. In my mind, that makes sense. And that's something Monkey DM kind of suggested at when he said, God, there's just so much content that I have on there. Like, yeah, you know, there's so much for people who pay so little. It's crazy value. And it makes me think you can start to inch the price a little bit higher once you've got a lot of content on the back. Well, yeah, every time, every month we go by releasing new episodes and Patreon exclusives is more value for our new patrons who come in and for the people who have been with us for a long time. They continue to grow with the podcast in terms of their content and get new stuff every month. So it's mm -hmm. one of those cool things that if you just keep producing the the content, you know, it can actually wind up adding more and more value to your offer the longer you're doing it. And so the offer does become more powerful. Um, another thing that I, I guess I want to talk a little bit about is just the success that he has. And even at the time, we didn't really nail this down, but we, we treated it pretty we treated it pretty delicately at the time because you never know how someone reacts to the amount of money that they are perceived to be pulling in. But um so we never actually addressed it directly. We knew he was being successful. And the numbers we talked about was him growing from like a couple bucks a month to $800 a month. And we were like, wow, that was a huge growth moment. Really, really powerful. That's awesome. But we never really went like, I don't think we ever mentioned that like by the time he was talking to us, he was already almost at $10,000 a month American that he was making per month from his Patreon, which is a tremendous amount. That's got to be one of the top tier patreons in the D, D space out there and for context i mean of course there's expenses patreon takes their cut we talked about how there's of course business expenses but he was able to scale his business up because of the investments that he was getting from that so once he got to the point you know he's paying for artists and he's paying for publishing he's paying for et cetera et cetera et cetera so he is now this is a reflections episode. And I think we should look at this and say, okay, how, well, what's really yeah, happened long? here? How um, long since the interview has it been, do you think? Oh, it's been a year at least. Has at it least been? maybe a year. I think it might be a year and a half, actually. Because uh, at this time, we had sounds, just released the second interview. Long. Well, we had just released the second interview at, when we were recording with him. Yeah. Well, maybe it's a year and like a few months. Because I think we, we started publishing in March, right? So hmm, maybe. Yeah, I think we're like, and, and it's June right now when recording this. When this gets released, who knows? I, our, our release schedule is wonky. Yeah, a but, little over uh, a year, though. But so so what's interesting, though, is like you, you'll hear this. It was very much of the time. It's right at the beginning of the Ukrainian war, right, which is still going on. Yeah. And they had just literally started like a month or so before that. And we had literally just started putting out our podcast and our content. Um, and it was all new. And we had just landed him as a as a as a guest and we were very appreciative of the fact that he would even talk to us because he was one of our biggest guests at the time that we had actually listened uh had a chance to talk to so all that to say that um he is now since then not only run a multi uh, how he ran a kickstarter after that that he mentions in there that he was working on and couldn't really talk about but has gone out and was hugely successful from my understanding over a million dollars raised for his uh steinhardt yeah. uh, area right like this is one of those things that you know we talked to him before that came out but then within a few months i think it was august he had launched it and he had created over a million dollars in funding for his um steinhardt campaign and and setting then 
on top of that, he has now raised over, I think he's up to $15,000 a month on Patreon. Again, doesn't get all of it, but he's grown basically about 30% just from the Patreon side of things. And, uh, you know, you, you take a look at all that. He's just continued to grow his Instagram. He's now over 60, 60 some odd thousand uh, people. Uh, yeah, 65,000, whereas he was at 48, maybe, when we started with him. And so, like, every little bit of his trajectory has gone up through a lot of what he's been doing. And so I just say this to say, like, if you haven't listened to that episode, like, go freaking listen to it. This guy knows what he's doing. He's got some really, really strong, strong nerdpreneur advice that you can pull out of that episode. And I would just make sure you go listen to it. And um, we're going to continue to talk about some of these <laughs> powerful principles here uh but his trajectory was going straight up you know and i really think we caught him at a really interesting time in his career because not like how often do you get to see someone who's like not quite at that huge place yet but then like a few months later is popping off as one of the top D D creators out there in the world yes it really was a special I mean, the conversation was so fun. I mean, listening back to it, it made me laugh out loud a few times because he's a funny guy. He's mm -hmm. really quite funny. His timing's really good. He's also just super generous and just kind. Mm -hmm. And and that translates a lot. And you can you don't see it in all of his content that he puts out, but you can tell that he likes what he does in his content, which is really appealing as a yeah. as a you know viewer. But yeah, he really did take off. And I think there's something in, in the stuff that we're talking about here today. I think there's a couple elements that have really helped him excel in into that level. And I think we've already talked about one, the generosity at an early level. Uh, and then, you know, having that generosity carry on. Because one thing I, that we didn't say that I wanted to double down on was that generosity is really important when as a new creator. I think it's really helpful to get people out there and notice when it's free because a lot of people don't know your value yet of what you're creating so they probably won't pay yet unless you, you are offering something free and you may not even know your value yet right like that's True. the other thing too is is sometimes you'll start putting stuff out and realize very quickly what resonates with people and what doesn't what doesn't and so the, what i'm really what i usually encourage people to do when they're putting out free content is really observe what moves the needle and mess around with your messaging a lot of what you're initially trying to find is who can you serve and how do you target them with your messaging because so many people just don't get the messaging right and so they because they don't have the messaging proper they don't get people moving towards their their eventual funnel which is say paying the money for a patreon or a membership or a, or a course or something like that but it's so key to be getting the messaging proper and so that it resonates with who you're trying to serve and who your say uh target market is or who your avatar is your ideal client and so knowing who that is and really nailing down the messaging social media posts and all these things this is like experimentation in many ways if you post like 25 videos in a month you're going to learn real quickly what kind of messaging works for your people or who is going to move in who's going to be moved by what you're providing in terms of value and then you'll be able to next month create 25 pieces of content that are much more targeted and focused on that area where you can provide value so i just uh always say like you know getting out there and doing the initial content for free and figuring it out that's that's an investment time to learn your market and learn the messaging that's going to resonate and move the needle and i actually just wanted to say something that always strikes me when you and i are creating content and that is that you are very good gonna toot your horn you are very good at coming up with this messaging and i really appreciate it it is something that you bring to this table that every time I'm like, oh. I mean, just the other day you came up with this call to action about like, if we get X number of Patreons, Patreon subscribers, we'll, we'll release this special bit of content. And, and I was like, fuck, why haven't we come up with this before? Like, that's so good. And it's not like it's the first time I've ever seen this strategy. It's just so many things are going on. It's so great that Chris thought of this. 
<laughs> well, thank you, Frank. Uh, <laughs> but it, but it, but it well, I I I do think that uh, for for me, messaging is one of my one of my more strong uh, areas because I I've always been thinking about sales or you know going through. Uh, I'm always thinking about sales and what, like, in aid of what, like, what am I creating this content for, and what's the purpose of this content? Um, and so, if uh, every piece of content should move the needle towards something, whether that be, you know, following our socials or uh, getting people to our Patreon or getting people to opt into an email list or you know, getting people to get excited about giving us a review. Uh, I mean, these are all things that we can call to action. And I, I figure, you know, nothing moves people like a deadline. So that's why right. when I said, you know, and by the way, this call to action was around <laughs> getting uh, Frank's band, which uh, is my high school band, his, his high school band, which uh, you may or may not uh, actually hear about this. Again, we'll see. But um, his and to clarify, high school band it was a rock band, not like a horn, you know, school band. It was like me and two other musicians rocking out on stage. Yeah. Did, did we ever figure out what the name of that band was? The Transistors. Oh, right, right. The Transistors. And... <laughs> I kept on wanting to call your ska band like the Bang and Franklins or something. Well, okay. Or, the ska or... band was a separate band. The Transistors oh. was a blues rock band. Oh, okay. okay. And gotcha. we 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 performed a bunch and we had like probably a dozen solid songs, but we only recording on a low budget was really hard. So we only ever recorded three. And but one of those yeah. songs was Sweet 16. <laughs> And I, I'm pretty sure we recorded Sweet 16. <laughs> and so sure. we are digging around into <laughs> the archives of Frank, trying to find that song right now, so that if we get five patrons by the end of this month, we will be able to release that just to patrons. I um, mean, I am hunting it down. I'm I'm going back home. I'm going to look through my old CDs. I've even reached out to the bandmates and been like, who has this? But get this. Okay. I haven't told you this, Chris. Okay. But one of the bandmates actually, he said he found a recording of our first show, a video video recording of our first what? show. Okay. And I and I'm like, dude, if you get that turned into like digital MP4, like I will pay, I will help pay for that because <laughs> I, that would be so fun to see. It'll probably be really shitty quality too because this was like early 2000s. Yeah, and I, I I would just, I mean, I would love to see it, but also just. Uh... I think our I I don't know about you, but like anything that can embarrass Frank, I'm <laughs> I'm all about that for our patrons. I mean, the board members, if Me you too. want to see some of that, let's uh let's get it. Like, tell your friends to join up for the board. Once we get to five, like another five patrons this month, I feel like that's enough to get to get Frank on board with releasing that to uh to people. I think it'd be pretty exciting. I um, think it'd be hilarious. I'm also just really excited to see it and but, share it with people. Hey Nerdpreneurs, Chris coming at you. You may have just been wondering, how do I get in to be a supporter of this podcast? Well, we use Patreon and we call all of our Patreon subscribers board members and they are part of the Awesome Nerdpreneur Board. Not only will board members receive extra content, extended interviews, and our undying love, in the future they'll also be invited to our Discord community as well as monthly staff meetings where they can ask us questions boardroom style and have an influence not only on who we interview but what we actually ask them in upcoming shows. Sounds pretty cool, right? Well, if you want to support us, go to patreon.com forward slash nerdpreneur and sign up to be a member of the board today. Now back to the episode. But nothing moves people like a deadline. You know, I, I got to say, you know, when people do these calls to action, um, I think like when I think about, for example, bringing it back to my DM, when we observed his actual Kickstarter, what was what's interesting, one of the keys to success with something like a Kickstarter is you have a window of opportunity in which you are allowed to invest. And without and if you buy by this certain time, you get these bonuses and these things. So that's all part of the offer. And it went so super, super well for them. But I think that if you're crafting your own offer, you have to have a deadline in place of like, what, you know, when you create an offer, whether it be for, say, a Patreon or for a membership site or for a course or for some 
uh, D and D content or something like that you're going to put out. If they buy by you know Friday at midnight or by a certain time, a five day window, let's say. If they buy in that time window, they either get a bunch of bonuses and after Friday, they don't get any of those bonuses or after Friday, that whole offer goes away. So it's either bonuses go away or the offer is different or it doesn't exist anymore because nothing, it's weird. Like people sometimes say, well, what, but, but don't I want people to buy stuff anytime? And it's like, yes, but you actually will sell a lot more by giving people that ultimatum of like buy now or it goes away forever or it goes away for a year because people need a deadline in which to reach decision and that's why things like kickstarter always have sort of like this is only open for this long and you have to invest now because it needs people to take action on it right away so as you're crafting your offers for your business, your nerdpreneur business, always have a window of opportunity where they can get this really awesome deal and then give them the opportunity to to purchase during that time period and something changes in the offer after that. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of these thoughts that uh, come to mind for us at least, and, and this is something we can discuss off mic too, but is we we have been planning to try different different pieces of content, you know, value adding content for our newsletter sign up. And the first one we have right now is the ultimate list of tabletop role playing games. Uh, and eventually, you know, that will not be free anymore. Eventually, that will go behind our Patreon paywall for the tier that is paying for that written content. So to any listeners that want to get their hands on that list, and, and it always gets updated as new tabletop role-playing games come out, or we learn that, you know, <clears throat> a link doesn't work or something else, not that that would ever happen, Ugh. but if it did, it gets updated. And we put that update back into the email list as it part of the, uh, you know, thank you for signing up, but then it'll no longer be available for free and it'll only be available on Patreon. I'm, I really also think there's a there's a couple things i wanted to talk about with calls to action just specifically on on how you could use it with uh with instagram because a lot of people you know like like i, I mentioned before like tiktok's for addicts right <laughs> you're gonna wind up you know posting every day a couple times a day and if you do that eventually you'll go viral and you create content and there's probably a value to that but i also find tiktok just wastes so much time and it's difficult even when you go viral it, let's say your video who goes viral doesn't have a call to action. Well, that's just a waste, right? Like that's the frustration. You might get a bunch of followers, but then what do you do? You have to kind of like go live and then try and convince people who are watching to move from there to another platform. The nice thing about Instagram and what I like about it is you can create an, a reel that the call to action is to follow, right? Like follow me for more, follow me for more. And if you just do that with your content and you're consistently putting out good solid content on a daily basis you're going to move farther and farther and farther people are going to really dig what you're doing and then once they follow here's the key to move them to an email list is you send them a direct message this is actually something i did to build my uh, original instagram and something we didn't talk about with monkey dm but i also think it's kind of a wicked tip is that you craft a really well designed copy message that you can customize for the person so everybody who follows you you have like a welcome message where it's like hey welcome to our uh you know welcome to our community uh, thanks for supporting us and following and liking our posts or et cetera, et cetera, right? So you're giving them indications of what they're already doing and thanking them. You're awesome. You probably don't hear that enough. And also, it, we actually have this really cool blah, 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 blah. It might be the tabletop RPG list, for example, that we're offering right now. Or it could be you know, our loot bag in the future. It could be any number of these things. And it's like, hey, if you would like to receive this extra thing, go opt into our list and you can send them an invite. Um, or you can say, hey, if you'd like to know how to get this, let me know. Send me a quick yes back. And when they send you a yes back, you can send them the link directly. So it is really a great way to move people from, say, uh, an Instagram profile and a follow towards an email list or a community uh, like a Discord, for example. You could also do that's the other thing I've thought about is that, you know, we start a Discord with our patrons down the road or a discord where people can join and meet other nerdpreneurs and hear from other people. And we have different tiers of people being able to do that. We can invite people to that discord as they join our, 
are 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 following and I, and I think that there's a lot of people that would probably want to be in a community with other like-minded individuals like that but they just don't have it because we're really the only nerdy business podcast or really nerdy business people out there I, I've looked there's just not a lot of people doing what we're doing or highlighting the type of businesses that I think are actually the future of business I think a yeah. lot of people don't even realize how big the nerdpreneur area of business is going to be because AI is going to kill so many things in the next coming years uh, that everybody's going to need to have their own nerdy passion that they can pull together to start a business. And uh, if you're not thinking that way, I'd be thinking about it now. Yeah, some sort of differentiating factor uh, from AI. The There was a couple things um, that I wanted to respond to. First off, uh, that Discord Nerdpreneur Discord server is one of our goals. So if you want that to happen sooner, join our Nerdpreneur board on Patreon. There, there you go. Another, another plug, another of the 50 times we've plugged the board. Uh, <laughs> second thing that you mentioned that I really liked about the messages that you send out to people who newly subscribe is the... Uh, the, the feeling of being seen and, and validated as a follower, you know, a new follower. I yeah. never get that. When I follow someone, I, I very, very rarely see someone acknowledge my presence and my joining of their community. And I think that that is a feeling that, that we all crave, especially on social media where it's so anonymous and, and faceless and we feel like it's just a dark void of you know, people throwing out posts without really engaging much. And that's yeah. the engagement is the, the real secret sauce, I think, of what we've seen with our guests is the secret, you know, of success, engagement, engaging yeah. with your community, engaging with your audience. And, and Monkey even said that. Monkey DM said that, you know, one of the things he does better than a lot of his competition is he still actually engages with anyone and everyone yeah. that reaches out to him. Yeah, I was very uh, impressed by his willingness to yeah respond to people in comments and he said you know i would go and comment on a hundred people in a day to get myself up to a thousand you know like that was just part of what he was doing on a day-to-day -day basis um and it's work it's really work to get to that first thousand you know the process of going and finding people who are in your niche following them and then sending them a message or commenting on a process on what they're uh, doing in their lives. It's not easy, but it's hard work. And once you do that for, you know, a bunch, a bunch of people, then you get follows back and people wind up following you and getting excited. Like we've been building our Instagram recently and it's growing great. So if you're not following that, go check it out. We post there regularly, but it's essentially going to be, and it's at Nerdpreneur Podcast, in case you were curious, we're not renaming ourselves something different. Um, so, <laughs> so basically, uh, yeah, if you have, if you have people who, who are, uh, you know, you're engaging with that, that work, that discipline that he has, you know, even in his day to day life, when we started going through, what is your habits? What are your daily habits? And, uh, I don't know if that even is going to make the, the public version or if it'll be just cut into the Patreon version of this interview, but his daily habits were crazy. Like every morning waking up and doing work and he works out six times a week, which is great for anybody I think to, to do, if you can have that level of discipline. And then it's, he wakes up at 4 AM and starts working early, right? And right. doing doing a lot of his writing and creative work in the morning because that works for him. And I know that's kind of like you too. You're an early riser. I'm the opposite. I'm like I yeah. woke up like ten minutes before this inner before we started <laughs> this thing, and I'm still having my coffee. And then for you, it's like you've probably been up I since wake, early. I've been up since five. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, one of the reasons I like working with you, Frank, and I'll I'll sing your praises on this is you have a lot of structure around your life that I think empowers you and you get a lot of validation and like power out of having that routine. And that is really I mean, I respect that a lot because I have done that temporarily in my life. But it's not the way I live my life every day. And it's not the way that I become very productive. I get a lot done, but it's just a different style. And you are like, just you're on it from the moment you're getting up and get things done. And then you're kind of like, at the end of the day, you really get to relax and chill, which I know because I can see on Discord when you're playing video games. It's like, <laughs> it's all, it's like you have that format in your life. Like you get to earn your time off. And I can see that. Uh, nice. Whereas me, I'm often like, when you're on that Discord doing the video game thing, I'm like, I'm editing the podcast, I'm doing all the work, I'm doing the stuff that I got to do at that point, because I, I like working later, later into the night, I get very productive later. I think I think a lot of that comes down to, and we did talk a little bit about this with him, but 
uh, we didn't really go much in depth about how this varies so much person to person. And I think you and I are both great examples of different people and what we prefer for our flow state. I prefer the morning for my flow state. To be honest, my prime time is 9 to 11 a.m. That's when I will, you know, if I could, that's when I'd be writing and I'd get shit done. That's when I'd be working on the podcast. Um, right now, my employer gets that prime time, and uh, it's a little hard for me sometimes. But I think that once people know their best, their optimal time or that flow state, like I said, knowing when that is and structuring your day around that, I think that's it's key. And and you just said like nighttime is your flow state. For me, it's morning, and I want to do the most. I want to have the best energy. And, and I, I want to structure my day so that my best energy is put towards what I really care about. And that's exercise, my health. And that's also podcast and educating myself. Those are the things that I put my best energy towards. Yeah. And then the end of the day, I'm, I'm pooped. That's where video games come in. I know that I used to wake up like right before work, get to work. And at the end of the day, I'd be pooped and I'd still be trying to do podcast stuff. And I was like, this doesn't make sense. And that's when I realized I really need to wake up earlier. I really need to get up so I can use that energy in the morning. And like I said, when I'm tired at the end of the day, I can still enjoy my video games um, for, but, you know, I go to bed. I go to bed earlier now. So less have video you, games. Have you ever read the book or heard the book Eat the Frog? I know about it. And I, yes, I think I know where you're going, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is a, I mean, I, you don't have to read the book guys. Cause it's really in the name, eat the frog. Yeah. And I'll explain the entire concept of the book to you right here. Uh, but Story time with Chris. Love yes, it. Essentially, if you had to wake up in the day and have to eat a big bulbous, disgusting frog, let me ask you when and what time would you eat the frog? Now, there's different philosophies on this, right? But some people would wake up and be like, the first thing I'm going to do is eat that frog and get it out of the way. Or, you know, would you take it and like, no, I'll do it in the afternoon. And then all morning, you're worried about eating this frog. You're like thinking about it. And so the work you're doing in the morning is somewhat affected by the, the hard thing you know you have to do later. And if you're like, I'm going to wait till the last minute of the day to get that done and eat the frog, and it'll be like the last thing. Then you're agonizing all day, dreading this moment where you have to eat the frog versus the person who just wakes up in the morning, knows they got to do that, eating the frog, and gets it done. And so for you, Frank, I know you said, like, my work is is something in the morning. And it's like, maybe that is eating the frog right now. Not that it's a bad thing or an awful thing. It's just a thing that you have to do. And it might be some of the harder work that you have to do. And by getting it done and out of the way, for me, I eat the frog on a lot of those things with my own job. I get the stuff I need to done or any of those things that are kind of the tough part like when i was in sales it was making phone calls booking my day doing the admin stuff that i had to do early so it's done and then i can just enjoy the rest of my day and do the rest of the things that i have to and i heard that in monkey dm because he wakes up eats the frog with some of his creative and heavy lifting work that he had to do around say building out his kickstarter i know he was working on at that time or doing some of that heavy creative lifting which i imagine is still fun for him but also is hard work and then getting to enjoy the rest of his day where he like, okay, I go work out as a break around like 9 or 10 a.m. And then he gets to go come back and do a little bit more work, but it's lighter work. And then by the evening time, he's kind of like just doing responding to messages on 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 his uh, socials and just sort of relaxing into the rest of the day and enjoying it. So. I think eating the frog is a good principle for for everybody to start thinking about is like, what is the really most important high leverage? hard job that you're avoiding doing that you should do every morning and put that into your schedule and just eat the frog just get it over with yeah that's a great like i think that's a really good lesson and in my day job we actually talk about this openly the eating the frog and the first thing and then there's the step on top of that when you think about what your frog will be and you decide what that frog is going to be and that will move your business, your objective the most, what will move, what we say at my job is what will move the needle forward every day. And that is something that you and I have, I, I kind of brought this up about goals and that's another episode that we had, but 
what is going to move the needle? What is going to make the proactive movement towards a desired outcome? And and when you can, you know, if we're going to stick with this bulbous, disgusting frog, you know, which frog do I need to eat in order to have success? Or <laughs> I don't, okay, this analogy only works so far. Like a frog is not going to, eating a frog isn't going to give me any kind of success. Um, but what what move in your business is going to help lead towards the biggest most you know rewarding value adding move to your business or to your audience there's high leverage activities that we avoid sometimes and that's really really key like in sales it's obvious it's it's prospecting you have to prospect every day if you're in sales but it's also kind of prospecting for us but it's not sales it's like for us i think some of those things might be creating really engaging high quality content and that is something that can be spread out among a number of uh, different platforms. So that is right now the podcast. Yes, we have to record these episodes. They have to be quality. They have to be made into something good and digestible and high value for people to listen to because that's the the main thing we're doing. But then we also, like, if we could cut those down into micro bite-sized reels that could be spread out over the course of a week and then just every day that's posted and every day a new nugget of wisdom from one of our episodes like that would be such a great thing and it's difficult because making that content just takes time it's high leverage but it takes a lot of time to do but i'm saying like man what could happen if we just had that every day of post and where would we be a month from now two months three months from now if we had you know, 90 pieces of content versus five pieces of content, you know, in the next three months. And so the the difference really is huge, I think, in terms of the amount of engagement and what we actually get back from it. Um, And then combine that with all the direct messaging and the welcome to community, opening a Discord, et cetera. That's where this thing can really scale up. Um, So I think that there are some things we could be doing better in terms of eating the frog. But of course, we also have to balance this around, around other obligations that we have from our family to our personal, to our jobs, to our et cetera, et cetera. And that's part of the nerdpreneur process is figuring out how to balance all those things so that we aren't swallowed up into a, uh, a ball of stress that makes us all choke. I actually, I mean, I really debate kind of going down this route because I always like to think about us being positive and and working in the right direction. And it's all about mindset. But talking about this, I mean, this episode was super awesome. And I think that I think that listeners can relate to this, which is why I want to bring it up. But listening to this episode was so inspiring, but it was also so frustrating because I get so frustrated in my day to day of going to my eight to five job and, you know, wanting to spend that time on this, on on the nerdpreneur process. I want to be doing this. And it's so frustrating that I don't get to during the job. And I think that it's just it's just it's great to see it. And great to know what could be done and what should be done. And if I had the time, but also knowing I can't because my work ethic, my code of conduct tells me I can't do that on the on the day job. I can't mm-hmm. do that because that's not right. That's not fair. And if I do, I need to then make it up somehow. Um, be, and, and I think that's an important value. Um, but I do also just think that it's really great it's going to be really great when that day does come and it's just, okay, you know what? going to set some time aside, going to like take a staycation and going to work on the podcast for a stint or hell, maybe even quit the job and just work on the podcast for however long my safety net can support me. Well, how cool. Well, this is the thing that happened to monkey DM too, is that he had that moment in his life that we call the critical mass moment where he went from that first patron which by the way we're really at that stage right now where we have our first patrons like i remember the first month we got a patron and it was like holy crap someone's paying us i know (laughs) because that's huge and he talked about that too monkey dm's like wow somebody's actually gonna give me 20 bucks or whatever that was a game changer and it's been a game changer for us now and that was by the way a year and a bit ago that we were talking to monkey dm about that we had no patreon going we had no money coming in we were 
just releasing our first episodes, and it took us about a year to get our first patron. And now we've got multiple patrons. We're starting to build in this way. And now it's like, okay, wow, we figured something out that's moving the needle in that direction. Now it becomes motivating to get to that critical mass moment, which is what Monkey DM created for himself in that, say, six months or eight months or whatever it was after starting down the path that he all of a sudden started to get like, wow, huge compendium reliefs. It's going to be three months of content all packaged up in one thing here you go and people went from like you know 100 bucks a month up to 800 bucks a month and all of a sudden he's just like okay that's a critical mass moment that's a place where i can now safely say i'm going to be doing this for my full time and really move the needle um towards getting getting higher value and i think that that's where we're at right now is we're on the way to our critical mass moment yeah, And so we need to find where does that critical mass, what are the action steps that we do to get to that critical mass moment in our business? And I agree with you, you know, it would be cool to make the podcast a full-time thing and to do that. But I've also had us talking with people who are doing this kind of thing full-time. And what's funny is the the challenge they often have is that like you don't have any more time. You just wind up having less time because you can literally work on the podcast or you can work on your business 24-7. And, you know, there's a lot of things that you can be able to do. That's where eating the frog and having those strategies around like, okay, what is the structure that you need to put in place for you to move the needle in the right direction every day and still enjoy your life? Um, you know, I think that there will be a transition point for us at some point where it, it makes sense for us to do that, but also it's not going to be clean. There's going to be some messed up things that we learn as we transition into that kind of uh, possibility for ourselves. And I don't know if I'll ever really leave my, my job is really flexible and awesome and i get so much access to great things my job is very different from yours i think and so there's an opportunity mm -hmm. with my job to continue to impact and get a ton of awesome things out of it and so if you can find a job where it supports that and also allows you to do the things that you love that's that's really where i'm at but i think for for you frank there may be well uh, don't get me wrong yeah. don't get me wrong like my yeah. job is pretty good but um i mean the dream is to do my own thing and to, yeah. to be my own boss entirely. I wanted to quickly go back though to what you said about the critical mass moment for Monkey mm -hmm. DM. And I think there was a, a nice lesson in there for anyone and everyone around reaching that critical mass moment. He had all this content that he just put into a very convenient package. And and I, I did ask him in that interview, do you if he thought it was the convenience that was the factor? And he said, well, it was more than that. You know, it was that, you know, he'd been, that's where the thank you principle and reciprocity came into the conversation. And it was that he had been providing all of this free stuff, but eventually he finally had, I still believe that con convenience is such a huge motivating factor in our lives when time is a scarcity, time and uh, just the, the, all of the things that, that require it. So when you can provide convenience, Amazon's a great example in their easy process of getting customers what they want, but that convenience, if you can somehow, and if we, for an example, if we can somehow create a convenient, like, you know, just as an example, a compendium of sorts, I'm not saying that we would do this or this is a great idea, but if we were to have a compendium of our interviews with a bunch of nuggets, you know, an audio form where people could say, okay, I would love to get an episode that just hits me with Instagram tips. And so we take all the Instagram snippets and we put from like the first 10 episodes or whatever, and we put it in to a 30 minute episode. You know, mm -hmm. that's an example of like, okay, I think people would be really interested in Instagram tips or, you know, whatever it, the subject is. Yeah. Well, and this is where I, one of the things I've thought about for us in creating future content and maybe people can email us at nerds at nerdpreneurpodcast.com if they like or dislike these kind of ideas or have suggestions but one of the best thing one of the things i've thought about is if we were to create a you know nerdpreneur book um it would be sort of transcripts from our podcasts and we mm. could categorize it based on like the topic so it might be you know that planning and inspiration stage like when you get your idea finding your passion that can be the first 
bit of it and we pull out stories and uh, excerpts from all of our interviews over the first year or two where it's like that's that's the way you do it and here are the principles and then chapter two on like you know finding your audience right and then crafting the messaging and getting that and then the next thing could be around you know creating your product or whatever et cetera, et cetera. and each step of the way we have a you know building your nerdpreneur business really from nerdpreneurs it's not actually that hard because we even talked to one of our people a mecca who learned who literally was a guy who created guidebooks for nintendo games right and right. it was a process of like getting all the information that was publicly available and then reprising it into a convenient nicely laid out good book that people could uh, do and using Amazon self-publishing to be able to do it. Like we could do something similar using transcripts from our stuff, even hiring people to help us with that process of crafting the book and making it into something. And if, and if, you know, people wanted to, uh, buy it, that would be really cool. It'd be a nice way for us to have like a, a gateway into the nerdpreneur universe and people could start uh, start there with us and then move into potentially, you know, our Patreon or listening to our podcast or, you know, maybe we run an event or we run courses or something down the line where people can go a little deeper with it. But I think that having something accessible like that, where it was pulled from our audience and pulled from the interviews we've already done is a really cool idea. And I think people might really dig it. Yeah, I think that's a pretty neat idea. It's uh I mean, it's kind of foreshadowing the uh, next episode with, like you said, with Emeka. So a little bit of how hmm. he did it and uh, some tips that we will talk about more in deppth in that one. Yeah. And kind of the extra challenges episode is what I mean. So for the next mm -hmm. month, when we actually we're trying to do these at least once a month. And so we're catching up slowly to <laughs> eventually have them timed with the one we're releasing. It's it's coming, people. Uh, yeah, but it's definitely tough when we release an interview a month and a reflections episode a month. The math ain't mathin, but yeah. we will eventually catch up. I'm I'm kind of liking the the way it works though. We get one of these reflections episodes on our interviews coming out each month, and I hope that there's because it gives people a chance to revisit something from the past, mm -hmm. takeaways, and also I think that having a little bit of distance between them allows us to also talk about the ideas we learned and incorporated into our business, and gives us that that place to to That's say true. okay, what worked and what didn't, and why. Is this going to work for us and why didn't it work for us? And so, yeah, look for Emeka's episode, which will be the next month's Reflections episode, which is very cool. And we're going to leave it right there. We spoke for another 15 minutes and Frank actually tells an amazing story about this time. He almost died in Italy. We go into a few more business tips and strategies that I think you'll really enjoy. And of course, you'll get access to all the other cool bonus content that we have. Go to patreon.com forward slash nerdpreneur to join the board now. Thanks for listening. And as always, keep it nerdy.